Thank you. Uh, as we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the, my, a couple of my coll collaborators on some of this work. Kim Stackhouse Lawson with uh, National Cattlemen's Beef Association is here in the audience. Tom Bataglis is with BASF Corporation, and you'll be seeing some of the, their contribution later on in the talk. So we're going to look at how do we quantify environmental footprints of uh, dairy and beef production. I'm going to be showing a lot of numbers and things as we go through the presentation. Again, I'd like to, you to keep more the, a focus on the, on the bigger picture and how we do things and, and some of the challenges in it uh, rather than, than the details of the numbers. We hear a lot about sustainability. Uh, we hear about unsustainable production systems and sustainable production systems and so forth. And most of that is somewhat subjective public opinion and so forth, but we are trying to really put, uh, to quantify, put numbers on these processes, but it is challenging as you'll see as we go through this. In terms of sustainability, most would agree that there's three major components. We have environmental issues, social issues, and economic issues. So in this presentation, we're going to be focused primarily on the environmental aspect but towards the end, we're going to build upon that and show how that kind of comes together with some of the other issues as well in an overall sustainability assessment. So what we're going to do, we're going to start by quantifying environmental footprints. Just how do we do it? Give you some numbers. We're going to go through two different case studies, one for a dairy farm and the other for a beef production system. And then we're going to go on from that to, to broaden it a little bit more than just environmental to look more at quantifying sustainability. And I'll end by giving some of my comments, I guess, on the challenges that we really face in this whole area of quantifying and comparing sustainability of products. In terms of environmental issues, we have, I've kind of divided up into four major co categories here. We have groundwater, surface water, and air quality issues, and then just the, the, the depletion of some of our natural resources. In terms of groundwater, this has been a, a major issue for, for many years now, really, I guess. Nitrates in groundwater has been the big thing. Uh, as illustrated here, we have excess moisture in the soil profile. It carries nutrients down below the root zone and eventually into the groundwater. And again, nitrates, the, the primary problem on this. Phosphorus can also leach. Generally, phosphorus leaching is not a problem unless you have like a, a drain, towel drain field or something that brings the phosphorus back to the surface. So in surface water, phosphorus is a major issue. So we need to look at the runoff of phosphorus as well as nitrogen. The amount of nitrogen that runs off of our farms is really very small, but yet even that small component can have a major impact on eutrophication of, of surface waters. In terms of air quality, uh, again, we have a, a number of uh, issues. We have as hazardous compounds. Uh, the major ones related to animal agriculture are ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. And then we have the greenhouse gases that are associated with climate change. And we have volatile organic compounds uh, that are associated really with ground level ozone production and smog, which is important in certain regions of the country and the world. In terms of resource depletion, of course, we have fossil energy. It's being depleted. Uh, I think the, the world's production of fossil fuels now has kind of peaked and is, is starting to decline. Water issues, we've been hearing about that this morning and, and in the press over the past year or two, it's become really important. Uh, certain areas of the country are, were very limited on water and how that impacts production systems. We also have certain minerals, phosphorus being one of them, where we have a limited supply that, that we're mining out of the earth. And when that's gone, it's gone. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind, too, as we assess the sustainability, the inputs and the outputs coming from our production systems. So the tool, we've heard about this earlier today, too, the tool that's normally used to assess sustainability, footprints, uh, life cycle assessment. So life cycle assessment really is an, a, an environmental accounting tool that considers all the important inputs and outputs uh, over the full life of the product. And it's often come, uh, ended at the farm gate, 
which we'll be looking at some here today. So we define that as a farm gate life cycle assessment. So it's just a partial life cycle assessment going to the point where the animal or the product leaves the farm. So to do a good life cycle assessment, we need many inputs and outputs quantified. Uh, sometimes we can measure them, most times we can't. Sometimes, most times we have to come up with some kind of an estimate. And an LCA is really only as good as the inventory data that is used to uh, produce that LCA. So that's what brings us to process-based modeling. So a process-based model can actually simulate the production system and create a lot of this inventory data and information needed to do a good LCA. So the model that we use is the integrated farm system model. It's been under development for a number of years. We keep adding to it, but it's being used and applied now pretty much across the United States and some other areas of the world where we can simulate food production systems, normally beef or dairy. Uh, we can do cropping systems too. But this is a process-based model, and what I mean by that is that we are modeling the actual processes, normally on a daily time step. So as illustrated here, uh, you know, we can start with something like crop growth simulated on a daily time step, looking at how the environment, the soil conditions, uh, affect the growth and development of the crop. As it reaches maturity, we simulate it through the harvesting process, storage, and so forth, keeping track of the resources that are used, such as fuel and labor inputs, also the changes in, in the losses and changes in quality of the feeds. Ultimately, we feed the animals. We predict how they're going to perform on the feeds available. We also predict the nutrient output of those animals based upon how they're fed. And then we uh, cycle those nutrients in the manure, uh, keeping track of the losses that occur, applying them back on the soil, keeping track of the losses that occur from that as we go through this cycle. And normally we simulate over like 25 years so we can get sort of a long-term look at how uh, weather is influencing this system. Looking at the performance of the system, then we do an economic analysis of the system, and of course the environmental impacts, the various environmental losses that occur. From those then, like I said, that gives us our inventory data that we need to do a farm gate analysis of the uh, carbon footprint, fossil energy use, water use, and in this case, what we're going to be looking at today is primary non-precipitation water use. So we'll define it as that. And then the last one is reactive nitrogen loss, which is just a total of all the reactive nitrogen in the form of ammonia, nitrates, um, NOx, nitrous oxide, and so forth. The total of all that uh, used in the production of the milk or meat that comes off the farm. So we define a footprint, or as labeled here, a hoof print, as some impact over some user benefit. Typically, in the standard procedures we use today, the impact could be, often is, carbon, greenhouse gas emissions. Can be fossil energy use, water use, or reactive nitrogen loss as some examples that we're going to be looking at here. So we total up the impact, divide that by the user benefit. The user benefit normally is just defined as pounds of milk, pounds of meat, something on that order, and that's what we'll be looking at. So to do a life cycle assessment, we need to consider all the direct emissions from the farm. As illustrated here, we have greenhouse gas emissions, so we have all the direct emissions uh, coming from uh, feed production, animal production, and the manure handling. Uh, of course, we have those direct, but we also have to consider the indirect, the secondary, or pre-chain sources. So these are the sources that uh, the, the emissions that occur or the inputs that are required to produce things that are coming onto the farm to be used, like fuel, electricity, fertilizers, even machinery, facilities, and that kind of thing. And then finally, we need to consider the emissions that are going to be allocated to co-products from the farm. 
And a big one here that we need to address is in dairy farms, a certain portion is allocated to the milk, another portion is allocated to the animals that are sold, the call animals that go into beef production. So there's different ways of allocating, and this becomes maybe one of the more controversial issues sometimes in LCA analysis. Uh, just deciding what method and what, what the process is justified. But this outlines four of the major types of allocation used. We have mass flow, which just simply divides between the, the mass of, say, animal tissue leaving the farm versus the mass of milk. An economic one probably is straightforward. It's based upon the economic value of one versus the other. Biophysical is usually what's preferred. It, gets into a little bit more detail looking at, say, some, for example, the amount of energy that would be used to produce the, the milk versus the amount of energy in the animal that is used to produce the meat. And system expansion just expands the system, basically to include both components, so it builds a, a broader system. So with that background now, that's sort of the way we do it. I'd like to go through two examples. The first one is dairy. We're looking at an actual farm here in New York. For those familiar with the names study, this is the New York names farm. So we have a herd of 1,260 cows plus their replacements. The milk production on an annual basis is about a little under 22 pounds of milk per cow. A little over 2,400 acres on this farm producing all the feed for the farm, uh, including alfalfa, corn, wheat, and grass, corn harvested as both silage and grain. The manure handling includes an anaerobic digester, liquid solid separation, and rapid incorporation. They're also exporting a little bit of the manure solids. And we're simulating this farm over 25 years of western, northwestern New York weather for that location. So to begin with, just to show you some of the evaluation of the model that we do to kind of make sure that the model really is representing the farm. This just shows a comparison of the feed produced uh, and used on the actual farm through reported records versus that simulated. Like you can see, we're doing a pretty good job. Since this had an anaerobic digester and was producing and using gas on the farm, this just shows again that we're doing a pretty good job of representing the gas that's being produced and used. So with that now, we'll go in and compare four different systems, and our, our base system here will be a slurry storage with surface application, no manure incorporation. So it's not the actual farm. Next, we'll add the liquid solid separation, recycling of solids uh, for bedding, open storage, no digester, rapid incorporation, and uh, uh, yeah, the rapid incorporation of the stored liquid uh, where, where a lot of the solids are recycled as bedding. For the third one then, we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to cover the manure storage or really enclose it, seal it, and we're going to use a flare to burn the gas that comes off. And then the final one is the actual farm, where they're using an anaerobic digester. So if we look at the carbon footprint of the base system here, not the actual farm, but the base system, it's about 0.9 pounds of CO2 equivalent per pound of fat and protein corrected milk. And again, don't get too hung up on the actual numbers, but kind of keep more general numbers in mind. And for instance, you can see about half of the total carbon footprint here is coming from methane produced by interior uh, production of the animal. Another 20% from the manure, you can see some of the rest if we look at how, these, uh, how the carbon footprint then varies across these systems, see between the first two there's not much change when we actually capture the methane from the manure storage. Uh, we can reduce the carbon footprint, say about 15% in this case. Let's look at the energy footprint, again about 0.9 uh, thousand BTUs per pound of milk. Three quarters of that Fossil energy use uh, is in pre-chain or secondary sources. 
So this is energy that's being used to produce the fuel, the electricity, the fertilizer, and so forth that's being used on the farm. If we look at the, across the systems, there's a little bit of a drop as we went from the, the base farm with the slurry storage to uh, the liquid uh, solid separation. Not a lot of change, but on when, then, when we added the anaerobic digester, captured and used that gas, we got a pretty substantial drop in the energy footprint. If we look at water footprint, again, about three quarters of the non-precipitation water use in this system is in pre-change sources. So things, it's water being used to produce other resources that are come onto the farm, not that used on the farm. And finally, the reactive nitrogen footprint, a little over a pound of nit reactive nitrogen loss per hundredweight of milk produced. Again, you can see over half of that is in ammonia emission. Uh, I think that's probably no surprise to those who work with manure management. That's, that's a, a big issue. Another third or so in nitrate leaching, and you can see more minor parts for nitrous oxide emission, combustion, and pre-chain. We look across systems, there's a slight decrease as we go from the base farm to the, the liquid solid separation and, and that type of system, but not much difference across those three. It's just a look at the production costs of that farm. Uh, see, the major costs are uh, the purchase feed and labor. See, the rest are pretty well equally divided. But overall, if you look at the economic uh, return on that farm, uh, between the first two, not much difference. When we're capturing that methane from the manure storage and burning it, uh, we're reducing the amount of methane that's going into the air, but we're not really getting any value out of that, so it is significantly decreasing the profitability of the farm. When we use the anaerobic digester and we utilize that gas, then we can bring the profitability back up to similar to that of the base operation. So next we'll look at the beef operation, and here we're looking at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska. Uh, this is a study we did a couple years ago. The farm, it consists of three major components. The farm, the farm is 5,000 acres, mostly corn and alfalfa that's being used to feed the, the feedlot animals. And there's a 5,500 cow calf operation on 24,000 acres of grassland. And then we have the feedlot finishing operation, finishing 3,700 cattle per year. So again, to do a little bit of evaluation, we started out by comparing what our model would pr predict in free production and use, energy use, and production costs. We won't go through a lot of detail, we just show some of the numbers to hope encourage you that, yeah, we can really do this. This is the actual reported feed production and use versus that simulated for one year, 2011. As you can see we were able to really calibrate, evaluate the model to get very close to what they were showing. This is a look at the energy use. Again, just looking at the numbers over here, very good agreement. So from that, we went on ahead and simulated this system then to look at both current and historical production. And in terms of the current, at that time, it was based on 2011 productions, the production system used that year. And we compared that uh, first to 2005, which was pr prior to the use of distillers grains in this operation. That was the major change. And then we also tried to go back, to, clear back to 1970, where we simulated a lot of different changes in the system. Uh, different cropping system, different crop and animal genetics, of course, machinery type and size of was being used back in the 70s and so forth. So first, this is the carbon footprint of the current production system. Again, you can see that over half comes from methane production, primarily enteric methane production. Another quarter from nitrous oxide production and so forth. If we look at historic changes then in the carbon footprint, you'll see there's some change uh, between 1970 and 2005. Uh, very little change 
uh, between 2005 and 2011. And what happened was it was actually a little bit of a, an increase in the carbon footprint because of the use of distillers' grains and the excess nitrogen uh, in the system for the use of that. If we look at the energy footprint, again, a little over half uh, is in pre-chain. So again, the resources that are being used on the farm and the energy that's being put in to produce those. The, major, the rest of the major part of it is really in feed production uh, and the feeding of the animals. If we look at across time, there's not much change in the actual energy footprint, but there is a pretty substantial change between 1970 and 2005 in the makeup of that footprint. If we look at water footprint, in this case a little over 80% of the non-precipitation water use uh, is in feed production, primarily irrigation of the, feed, of the crops that they're producing on that operation. If we look at it historically, there's been a pretty sizable increase in the water footprint due to increased use of irrigation. They are now irrigating pasture in some of their production systems. Not necessarily a common practice in the beef industry, but it is being done at mark, and that's increasing the water footprint. In terms of reactive nitrogen loss, a little over 80% uh, due to ammonia emission both in the feedlot and the pasture of the grazing animals. And if we look at the changes that have occurred between 1970 and 2005, we got a pretty substantial drop in the reactive nitrogen footprint. But again, with the increased use of distiller's grains now, that's basically been reversed, and we're pretty much back to 1970 level. Uh, again, mostly because of overfeeding protein and the ammonia emission that, that's coming from that, from the feed yard. So with that now, I'd like to kind of build more into the whole sustainability issue. Working with the definition, and you, you can find lots of different definitions of sustainability, but it usually comes out to something like this, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. The beef industry has actually come up with their own definition of meeting the growing demand of beef by balancing environmental responsibility, economic opportunity, and social diligence. So as I indicated before in, in the early part of the presentation, three major components that we have to consider in, in quantifying sustainability, uh, the social, the environmental, and the economic. And we've looked at some of the environmental here, not necessarily all of them, and we've talked a little bit about economics. We haven't addressed much on the social, and I won't get into that much today, but we have, I'll show you some numbers of what we have come up with so far. So what I'm gonna do here now is look at the full life cycle of the beef production, and this is perhaps one of the most complex product, food production systems uh, of, that's ever been addressed with, a, uh, with an LCA analysis, but. And again, all the numbers that I'll be showing you here today are based on the MARC production system and what follows it in, in, throughout the, the remaining life cycle, which includes the packer, um, any transport, marketing, clear to the consumer. And to do this assessment now, we're using a little different tool. This is a tool created by BASF Corporation usually referred to as C-balance, but it takes all the inputs that we're bringing in from the farm gate analysis, building the rest of the system onto it to look at the full life cycle. So this just lists not all, but some of the more major components that are being considered in this full assessment. So again, we'll just kind of look at some numbers here. We'll start with greenhouse gas emission. This is the uh, carbon footprint for the full production system. Here we can't go back to 1970. We just couldn't find the, the packer information and so forth to go back that far, but we do have 2005 versus 2011. So you don't see a lot of change there, but there actually is a little bit. 
I guess maybe the thing to note here is that the large majority of the carbon footprint does occur prior up to the farm gate. And since 2005, we have actually reduced the, the, the overall life cycle um, carbon footprint of beef by about 2%. And this comes from uh, just improved energy efficiency in, in uh, the system. Another thing is the increased use of biogas recovery at the packer. Uh, much of that has been implemented in the past five years. And some increase in crop yields, particularly corn production during that time period. If we look at solid waste, you see some change there, some reduction, uh, probably equally split between on-farm and off-farm. And overall, the, the reduction that we've come up with is 7%. This is the acidification. Ammonia is a big component in this. Uh, again, you can see that almost all of it comes from on-farm production. And since 2005 to 2011, we were able to reduce the acidification factor by about 3%. Next is water emissions. See some improvement there, both on-farm and off-farm, probably uh, the biggest factor shown here is some changes made in, in getting case-ready meat produced. So overall, about a 10% reduction in water emissions. And finally, this is getting more into the social issues. This is looking at occupational illnesses and accidents. And there was actually a very substantial reduction shown here. And don't ask me to explain this. I don't know. But it comes from reputable sources, I guess. Uh, this was data that, that, that uh, came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, specifically for this sector of beef production. So overall, a little over a 30% decrease in this area. So I won't go through any more, but that gives you an idea of how we're quantifying things. Then how do we get to one number? So we use what we call relevance factors, and these were based upon sort of I guess public perception of what they feel, what the general public feels is more important versus another. So you can see here that, that toxicity potential is rated pretty high, water emissions is pretty high, some of the others get much lower ratings. But by taking individual numbers that we've calculated for each of the individual components, multiplying them by this relevance factor, we can get one number. So that's what we come up here with here, and it was what we're defining as an eco-efficiency portfolio. This just shows the change between 2005 and 2011. And this figure needs some explanation, but these are just all relative numbers at this point. But where you don't want to be is down in this quadrant, where you have a high cost to society and a high environmental impact. Where you want to be is up here, low cost, low environmental impact. So what this shows is that between 2005 and 2011, we made about a 7% improvement in environmental impact. But there was about a 2% decrease in economic impact. A lot of that had to do with the uh, price of corn. So if we ran this same analysis today with some of the price changes and things that are now occurring, my guess is this ball would be moving this direction a few percent. But we haven't done that. So that's the system. And just a few more points now to close on. I mean, what is the major loss in sustainability if you look at either milk or meat production and I would say probably any food produced in the United States, perhaps even the world. What do you think? Food waste. The data shows, I guess, that we, particularly in America, waste 30 to 40 percent of our food. And I think that's probably true for milk and beef and, and a lot of other things. When you waste 30 to 40 percent, that automatically increases every aspect of measure of footprint, 
sustainability, whatever you want to define it, when you go through this process, it increases them all by 30 to 40 percent. There's nothing else that's going to have that kind of impact on the system. So which is more sustainable? If we go through our traditional analysis that we just showed, I think there's no question, whoops, this is going to come out with the lowest numbers per unit of food, okay? And if you put some milk on that, you're going to get some nutrition out of it. <laughs> if you're like many who dump that milk down the drain after you eat the cereal, I mean, that's adding to the waste. But for the consumer, does that affect their footprint? Actually, it does not. Their contribution to the overall footprint of milk production, is it affected when the consumer dumps it down the drain? It is not. What it does is it increases the producer's footprint 30 to 40 percent. Is that fair? I don't think so. But our standard procedures today, the way we do LCA, that's the way it works out. So do we want to compare these? I would say no, we don't. But we, that's not really within our control. It is being done for us. And if you're probably all familiar with the, the dairy, di dairy, dietary guidelines that are produced, I think they're revised every five years, and there's a substantial movement now as they refine the dietary guidelines for 2015 and beyond to in involve environmental sustainability as part of the criteria for the dietary guidelines. So, where they get the information for that? I don't know. Public opinion, you know, just sort of what feels right, I guess, to them. We just don't have the science and data to back it up but it is happening. So go back to our footprint. We're looking at impact over user benefit. And as I said, we're usually using some weighted uh, average of environmental, social, and economic impacts to come up with this number. We're using some unit of uh, production for the denominator. We put considerable effort into defining this part of the equation, we have put essentially no effort in defining this part of the equation. And I think that's a problem and that's a challenge and that's what we need to work towards. How do, if we're really going to compare one food to another, how do we come up with this value? Not that it can't be done, but it's going to take a lot more work than what we've put into it so far. So, in conclusion, environmental footprints uh, developed through life cycle assessment provide valuable tools for assessing sustainability. I think that that is true and that's good and particularly evaluating the sustainability of a product against itself as we've shown here, showing improvements of how we're gaining and doing better. When we start comparing one product to another, we're on shaky ground. So. I would define LCA as an infant science, and maybe calling it a science is sort of a stretch at times, but it's something that's developing, and we have a long way to go, I guess, if we're, as we use this tool, and particularly if we want to get to the uh, point of comparing uh, different production systems and, and different food products and that sort of thing. So, thank you. We have time for uh, one quick question before we move on. Anyone? <laughs>